Darling one, you were born from the sweetest love, cast from the fires of creation, burning bright into the making of your perfect constellations. Head high, my love, never let them diminish you. Stand tall in the power of your love. Break open to the thousands come before you, written in your heart with holy blood. Keep going, my love. Hold tight to the scripture of your inheritance, your dreams born from ancient stone. Weave your magic star of wisdom, breathing life into hollow bones. Courage, my love. Place pain upon your sacred altars. Grow seeds where life has become hopeless. Lend hands to those who fall and falter. Let love be life's greatest opus. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're here live, a very big welcome to you. And if you're watching, uh, listening to this recording, a big welcome to you as well. My name is Tara Wild, and I'm the creator of the Dreaming the Ancestors podcast series and community, where we talk about remembering and reclaiming ancestral stories, feminine wisdom, and earth magic. And today, I'm very, very excited to welcome one of my beloved mentors, Karen Ward, to this podcast this episode and uh, this is the fourth episode of the second season and in this season we are really focusing on uplifting the voices of native celtic voices and we're streaming live on youtube and on facebook and if you are here live please feel free to say hello in the chat and let us know where you're calling in from it's so lovely to see some of you already here in the chat hello hello and a very big welcome to you all so I'm going to bring Karen on now, and it's just such a pleasure to welcome Karen back to the podcast. She was actually in the first season of Dreaming the Ancestors, and it was so lovely to have her. So Karen, welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, Tara, always a pleasure. What you're doing here, the, well, how you're bringing out this to the world and you're spreading it around our glorious planet, especially to those of us with Celtic soul, means so much to so many. And I, I want to give tribute to all that you do and to say hello to all those who are with us. Mm. Thank you so much, Karen. Those words mean a lot to me and I appreciate you so much as a mentor and a leader in this space. So it's so beautiful to have you back here on the podcast. And just a little reminder to everyone who's watching live, you uh, have the ability to ask Karen any questions that you have. So please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. And if we don't answer the questions by the end, I'll make sure to bring them forward. So thank you for being here, Karen. And I'm going to read out Karen's official bio for everyone so you can get a sense of the wonderful work that she does in the world. Karen Ward is a communicator, myth maker, and bridging activator. As an academic with a master's and PhD in counseling, psychotherapy, and spirituality, she lectures and facilitates motivational and inspiring talks on a variety of holistic health subjects. With her husband, John Cantwell, Karen teaches and runs a school of Celtic shamanism, holistic living called Shli and Cree, introducing energy awareness through nature and self soul work. At her clinic in Smithfield in Dublin, she treats all of her treasured clients from a mind, body, spirit and energetic perspective. As a shamanic practitioner, supervisor, and teacher trained in the Celtic lineage and Druidic traditions, Karen founded and runs Moon Mana, women's Celtic circles, offering rites of passage ceremonies and online courses. Her television work includes energy therapist on BBC's Last Resort and holistic therapy presenter from RTE's Health Squad. She's also the author of the annual Moon Mana Diary Journal, and this beautifully presented innovative book highlights the deep connection of women's monthly cycles with the moon. 
She's also the writer of the innovative book, Change a Little to Change a Lot, and is a regular contributor to Naturally Good Health magazine and RTE's website, Brainstorm Section. Karen co-rediscovered the Bridget's Way Celtic pilgrimage, which we're going to be talking a little bit about later, and she is guided in all that she does by this quintessential fiery Irish goddess. Ah, oh, thank you, Karen, for this beautiful work that you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'd like to take this moment to close our eyes, all of us who are sitting here together, and just really come into our heart space in this moment and just feel that we're having this conversation in the flesh, heart to heart, that we're gathered around a great fire and we're sharing wisdom we're sharing stories as our ancestors have done since time immemorial. And listeners, I really invite you to imagine this in your heart, in your mind, this gathering. And as we're holding this vision together, I'd like to invite Karen and myself to invite in our ancestors. And as we're doing this, you are most welcome as well, all of you who are listening, to invite in, welcome in your wise and well ancestors, any guides that you have, as we are walking this pathway of remembrance together. So I would like to call to the wise grandmothers of my lineage, And I really feel them stepping into this space with us, feeling their wisdom wanting to come forwards as we begin this conversation about the women and the water. And really honoring all of my ancestors who worked closely with the waters, who worked by the sea, who walked the shores of Ireland, in the Celtic Isles. And I'm having a vision in this moment of the ancestors gathering seaweed, fishing, some of these really, really deep ancestral practices that have nourished our lineages for a long, long time, especially those of us with ancestry, where they come from the Celtic Isles, which is so connected to the sea wise grandmothers, ancestors of the sea and the water, I honor you and welcome you into this space. And I also honor the ancestors of the lands that I stand upon, the ancestral lands of the Ute and Arapaho people. I deeply, deeply honor you in this moment, giving gratitude for the nourishment that I receive from these lands, the ways that I root into place here this place that I have come to call home. And finally, I would like to welcome in my beloved goddess guide, Bridget. Really feeling Bridget's connection to the holy wells, of the Celtic Isles. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Blessed be. And I will pass over to you, Karen. Well, Tara, I could think of no better way of preparing for today than having a dip in the sea. And I come to you from a very interesting part of Ireland. I'm in the Bera Peninsula. And some of you might be familiar with the Hag of Bera, or the wise old wily crone. And as I had my dip in preparation, lo and behold, three dolphins swam into the bay. And that hasn't happened in 10 years. We see them out further out at sea, but for them to swim into the bay is unusual. And I noted that and I thought, ah, yes, we are in the flow. And then as I came in to come to you from this beautiful part of Ireland, the glorious half moon was in the sky, shining brightly. She's just the other side of the half moon now, 
um, beautifully waxing to her fullness. So it really spoke to me of the delicious signs and synchronicities that we're constantly in reciprocity with nature, with God, goddess, spirit, whatever you might refer to as that transpersonal element. And I'm always attuned, shall we say, to what's going on around us, as indeed were our ancestors so long ago. And it's so heartwarming and nourishing, Tara, to hear through you to all of us here that these practices are, they, they're evolving. And we modern women acknowledge the wisdom of our ancestors, but we're teaching our little ones the same. Thank you so, so much, Karen. Mm. So beautiful to feel the energy of the sea coming with you through this transmission together and the dolphins. Wow, just so beautiful. And so I'm just going to speak a few words to introduce this episode for today. And the title of this episode is The Wisdom of Women and Water. And this is something that has been coming up a lot lately in my personal practice, my spiritual practice. And it's a theme that uh, we're also currently exploring in my monthly membership called Wild and Wise. And the first thing that I really feel called to share about this topic is that in the ancient traditions of the Celtic Isles, there is a very strong connection between women and water, a very, very sacred connection. And this connection is mythically expressed in numerous medieval texts. It's encoded into the memory of the sacred wells, the rivers, the lakes and lochs. And many bodies of water across the Celtic Isles are named after goddesses. So this is a really fundamental connection between women and the energy of fluid and flow, represented by the menstrual cycle that connects to the cycles of Grandmother Moon, who holds sway over the tides, of course. And, you know, while I'm aware that not everyone who menstruates is a woman and not everyone who is a woman menstruates, the menstrual cycle has been vital, sacred, important to so many, many, many women through the generations since time immemorial. And there's also a beautiful sacred connection to our sexual fluids and the waters of the womb that hold our beloved babies in utero. And we see all of these connections reflected back to us in nature. We see uh, this reflected in the sacred waters of the land. The lakes and wells are womb-like in nature, representing the sacred waters of Great Mother, Mother Earth. The rivers are flowing symbols of life, just as the fluids flow from our sacred womb space. And in my monthly membership, we've been talking a lot about these connections, and it's really amazing to hear how many women connect with the sacred energies of water and flow. It feels like such a deep remembrance, this ancient feminine wisdom that has been largely forgotten but is being reclaimed. So Karen, I'd love to pass over to you now and just begin by hearing a little bit about your personal journey with reclaiming ancient feminine wisdom and your connection to the sacred waters. Oh, thank you, Tara. Um, I often start telling people about my journey by explaining that I was the little girl who played with the fairies at the bottom of her grandmother's garden, thinking this was completely natural. And being entranced by the morning dew on the leaves or the birds singing and coming down to the little bird bath that she had in her garden. And I realized quite quickly that not everybody thought like this. And in the ways of the world, as a, as a young child, I realized that this is, is very private and it wasn't something to talk about in school or with those who didn't understand. And when I was a teenager, I had a fascination with the power of the sea. Anytime I was near the sea, the, the, the waves coming in, the waves coming out, there was, there was a yearning, a visceral, palpable pull. And of course, I didn't realize it at the time how Grandmother Moon moves our tides 
worldwide twice a day. And I suppose in those early teenage years, you know, after puberty, I I was becoming aware of my sexuality. And funny enough, I always thought that I would meet a man who was very much of the sea. And indeed, my husband is, um, he's a bit like a merman, to be quite honest. And the funny thing is, for us Irish who live on this tiny island off the west coast of Europe, it's often when we leave, when we come away and we look back with perspective, that it becomes really, really strong in the, the connection and the realisation of what we have. Because if you think of the world wars, if you think of um, all of that's happened in the world, because we were so small, we we avoided quite a lot of that. So there was a, a pristineness. There was very much an indigenous nature that was held there in the land. And that very much comes back to um, my Celtic roots, which I began to explore as a voracious reader as a young woman. But more and more in recent years, I've come to realize that everything about our spirituality is the land and the sea. The fact that we're surrounded on three sides by the Atlantic Ocean and on one side by the Irish Sea. And there's that beautiful dance between the land and the sea. And then the river goddesses permeating the energy in the land, much like if anybody's familiar with acupuncture, the acupuncture meridians, if you think of those energy flows down the body, similarly, the ley lines in the land, but also the rivers that, that feed and nourish the land. And they would be seen as uniquely feminine, whereas the Irish god of the sea, Monomon MacLear, is, he's basically our Neptune, if you will. He's the sea god. But he also had nine daughters. And again, the, the feminine, that yin yang with the masculine and the feminine, the divine feminine, the divine masculine is very much part of our culture and the ancient wisdom of this beautiful land. Thank you so much, Karen, for that beautiful uh, little introduction. And yes, I love it when you speak about your connection with the Fae as a young, as a young girl and just I feel that energy so much in Ireland that the Fae are still so alive there as you're speaking to the, the nature of the indigenous traditions that are held within the land and the waters. So thank you so much for sharing. And I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about the different connections between women and water in Irish myth and legend and the importance of water in general in the Irish shamanic tradition. Hmm. I, I think. I might start by by stating what we know now that at least 70% of our bodies, our human bodies are made of water. And we are recognizing that the, the tides coming in and out that has an ebb and flow of grandmother moon's effect on us and our moods and our emotions. And of course, our, the ancient forebearers, they knew all this. They were so attuned, not just to the land and the sea, but to the stars and how everything beautifully connected. And it is said that the first people that came to Ireland, now we're talking about before 10,000 years ago, and the, the island was covered in trees. It's said that a red squirrel could travel from the lower reaches of Ireland all the way up to the tip in the north without ever putting their paws on the ground. It was a very wooded place. But the, the liminal place, the shorelines around the island were a really important part of the people who came to live here recognized that there was a sovereignty of the land and woven into our myth and legend is the nine waves. In other words, when a little one is born, they would be welcomed into the tribe with the blessing of the nine waves. And this, we know this from the Carmen Gedelica, one of those ancient texts you mentioned. And this was Bridget as midwife blessing. And 
I suppose I can describe a tower by describing what it's not first. If you were a part of one of the Irish tribes and you did a misdemeanor, you would be banished from the island and sent beyond the ninth wave. Now, this was the worst punishment anybody could have. And you'd imagine nowadays, well, would you not imprison somebody or would you, you know, do something to them? No, no, no. To banish them from the island was the unthinkable. So therefore, to welcome somebody in with the blessing of the nine waves was truly an immense honour. Not just you, little one, are now part of our tribe, but you are part of this land. And the, the ninth wave, in other words, the, the seas around are um, a beautiful framework, a holding, a cauldron of who we are recognizing that, of course, we've been swimming around in these amniotic fluids, these salty waters for nine months or thereabouts. And this continuum, if you will, that, that flow from this in the darkness of the womb to emerge and to connect with the land. And because we're such a small island, most of us, even in the Midlands, have access to the sea. We're not that far away. But as you've mentioned before, the lakes and the rivers and the streams, that fresh water, that element that is so important to life is ever present. Thank you so much, Karen, for sharing. Uh, yeah, I actually did not know about the ninth wave and how people were welcomed into the tribe that way. So, so beautiful. And what was just coming to mind too, as you were sharing about the worst thing that could happen to someone is to be sent beyond the nine waves. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm thinking about um, the this this whole wave of emigration that has happened uh, in the past hundreds of years, where people were leaving Ireland because of poverty, because of famine, and all of these different uh, traumas through colonialism and what have you. And um, you know, I do obviously a lot of work as an American with uh, you know healing that divide, healing that divide in the ancestry. And it's so interesting to be, I physically feel that separation of being beyond the nine waves and, uh, and being disconnected from the land in that way. So that was really, really interesting to hear. Thank you for sharing that, Karen. Mm -hmm. And I love that you were speaking about the sea and uh, just imagining to I Ireland as, you know, the, the child, like the that's surrounded by those waters of the womb, right? So it's this macrocosm and microcosm that connects really, really beautiful. And I'd love to go a little bit uh, into the the wells, the holy wells now. And I once read a survey that was carried out in the 1940s in Ireland that there are over 3,000 3, wells accounted for. And for a small island, of course, that's really a lot. And I know there are so many beautiful traditions surrounding the holy wells. So I'd love it if you could share a bit about the ancient traditions of the holy wells in Ireland and how these traditions have evolved with uh, the arrival of Christianity. So from pagan times into more Christian times and the weaving of the two. Yeah, great question, Tara. The, the wells, think in terms of a well as being a deep source. If we stand on a shoreline of the sea or the ocean or a lake, we see an expanse into the horizon. If we stand and we look down into a well, it goes deep into the source and the belly of Mother Earth. And our pagan communities would have used wells, as we can imagine, for sustenance, for to replenish the water in their bodies, for cooking, for cleaning. But there was a deep spiritual significance because the archaeologists would have discovered that the wells were, there were stones put around them in such a way to denote that there was um, a spiritual significance. It wasn't just, let's get the water and make a nice cup of tea. There was so much more to it. And the, the ritual of a cleanse 
an auric cleanse, our natural energy field was really important. So therefore we weren't just cleansing our physical bodies, but they were to all intents and purposes, cleansing themselves energetically from what we can understand from those archeological excavations. And some of those pagan traditions have merged with the Christian monks that came first and then the whole Roman Catholicism. And basically it was to go to the well and to walk around it clockwise, diocel, sunwise, three times. And as many know, the number three is a very important number within the Celtic world. We think of the triple spiral out, actually I have it here, the triple spiral outside uh, Newgrange and on many of the sacred sites. And the idea was that you walked around the well three times and anybody who's an energetic practitioner will know that going clockwise enhances something, anti-clockwise will open something or release. So by walking in a pattern, if you will, clockwise, it was coming into what we might call reciprocity with the well. It was approaching it with respect, with honor, and then looking into the well. And of course, divination came into this with what can you see when you look into the well? A bit like we, we might have an idea of looking into a crystal ball, that same sort of principle. And from what we know, the wells were tended usually by women. And these would have been called the well maidens. And not just in Ireland, but over many, many different cultures up, up in Scandinavia, there, there would have been the Rhine maidens. Um, in England, we think of the story of the Holy Grail and the, the well maidens who were desecrated in Greek and Roman times all over the world, and no doubt in your fair land as well. And that really spoke of how water and women are inextricably linked. And as you beautifully mentioned so eloquently earlier on, that the the womb, the waters of our womb, the shedding of our menstrual blood, our moon time in that beautiful cycle with the moon and her phases, the same 28 day cycle or thereabouts. And swimming around in the amniotic fluid, as we mentioned earlier on. And the our ancestors could see that very, very deep connection. Therefore, the rivers were associated with goddesses, Bandia, goddess, and the wells as well. When the Christian monks came, and they were said to be actually quite pagan in their way, if we think of the monks off the islands, the Skellig Islands, off the coast, the southwest coast of Kerry, in these really remote places, surrounded by the thrashing seas, as places of deep, deep spiritual contemplation. And with the wells, they, how would you say, they sat on top of the layering of what was already there. So a pattern day, which would be practiced even now within the Catholic faith here, the pattern day of walking around the wells is still used. Another beautiful um, ancient tradition was to tie a rag, a clouty as it's known, around usually a hawthorn tree or an ash tree beside the wells. And this was to, to make an intention, a prayer, tie your wish on, and then you would leave it there and you could walk away free and easy of the worry or the stress or whatever it was. And frequently you see that still on those trees around wells and hawthorn trees in general. They're usually around the border of, of a field or a property. So in other words, there's been this glorious mix of the ancient evolving forward, mixing with the Catholic, and then coming out of the Catholic into this the nature-based spirituality that so many people are now returning to and exploring which is 
just makes my heart sing. Such beautiful storytelling, Karen. Just so beautiful to hear your your transmission about that connection between the women and water. And to feel that this is something that we find in many different cultures, not just in Ireland, but in other parts of the Celtic Isles, mm -hmm. other parts of Europe, other parts of the world. And this connection feels so deep. And when I was in Ireland in 2018, uh, I actually spent two months uh, staying beside one of Bridget's wells in Fahart and went to the well multiple times a week and had such a beautiful experience and it really changed my life. And I, I went to heal, that was my intention. I was having some physical health challenges, which of course always have a, a deeper level of emotional, spiritual rooting, right? That causes the dis-ease. And so, yeah, I went to the well and really, really spent time with Bridget at, at the sacred well in Fahart and it was incredibly healing. And I also got to go to a mass for St. Bridget, a Catholic mass. Mm -hmm. And we went and we walked around the well and it was very funny because the priest uh, the priest was going anti-clockwise around the well by accident, it seemed. <laughs> <laughs> and people were like, we are not doing that. <laughs> And it was very funny. So I love that you brought in the, the significance of going sunwise. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I, I had such a moving experience with Bridget at the Sacred Well in Fahart. And I would love, I know that you have a very special connection to Bridget uh, as well. And I would love to hear uh, more about that connection between Bridget and the sacred wells. Um, and, you know, t for anyone who's not familiar with goddess Bridget as well, maybe a little bit about who she is. Bridget is the, oh, she's such an archetypal energy of Ireland. Um, she is a triple goddess, but not like the maiden mother crone that we might think, but she has, there's three goddesses called Bridget. And one is the Smith, Smithcraft, which nowadays you might think, really? But if you think back in those days, to be able to work the alchemy with precious metals and to turn them into cauldrons and tools and was indeed magical. She was also the inspiration for poets, for creation. I mean, again, so important. And then thirdly, she was the healer the midwife, uh, the, the, the carer, the, the one who could perform miracles. And goddess Bridget was very much revered as part of the Thuad Dedanon. And some would say she was the daughter of the Dagda. You hear other stories saying, was she the Dagda's wife? Was she his daughter-in-law? Most people would say a daughter. And then we come to Saint Bridget. And St. Bridget was an extraordinary woman who very much harnessed the energies of Goddess Bridget. Now, interestingly enough, in the medieval text you mentioned, there's very much stories about Bridget. There's very much stories about St. Bridget, but no one text links them. However, there are those, and I will be hold my hand up, I'm definitely one, who believe that Bridget, the woman, the saint, the matron saint of Ireland, was a woman incarnate of the goddess. Now, I suppose I could explain what I mean here is, um, I think no matter what belief system you have in the world, you've probably heard of Jesus Christ and how in the Catholic faith, he is the son of God made man. So where's the women? And to me, Bridget was one of those women, that she was an extraordinary child, and her father was a chieftain and her mother was his bondswoman or basically a slave. And he was married to somebody else. You can imagine that didn't go down too well. And when Bridget was born, it was said that her mother had one foot inside the house and one foot outside. So Bridget was born, her, the waters of her birth, the fluid broke and she beautifully slid out on one side of the inside and outside. So again, that speaks of that liminal place. She was beloved of everyone, an extraordinary child. She used to give away 
her father's jewel encrusted sword to the lepers and somebody would give her um, her food to whoever needed it. And there's oh, there's so many stories of her, but I think two maybe are pertinent. Um, it came time for her to marry. She was probably about 13. And very unusually, her chieftain father for a slave child, an illegitimate child, as it was terribly known in those days, um, he offered a dowry for her. So suitors came from far and wide to take her hand. And Bridget told her parents, no, 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 I, I'm not going to marry. I am I'm going to establish a spiritual community. And of course, they probably thought, she's joking. She's just, you know, she'll get over it. But interestingly enough, Bridget performed a very important miracle, I suppose we'd call it, which archetype, arch, the archetypal energy of this really speaks to us down the ages because she plucked out her eye. All the suitors ran away going, I'm not going to marry her. And when her father and mother said, oh, Bridget, of course, you don't have to marry anybody. Have your spiritual life. She put her eye back in absolutely perfectly. In other words, she got what she wanted, not by making the other person. In other words, of their own volition, her parents gave her what she wanted. And similarly, when she traveled all the way down from Fahard Louth through Mead to Kildare to establish her community, and she would have been a slip of a girl, she asked the local chieftain there for some land. And of course he thought, who is this girl? But to humor her, he said, well, look, I'll give you the land that your cloak covers. And of course, Bridget says, oh, thank you so much. And surprise, surprise, the cloak spread and spread and spread over this vast, beautiful, rich land. And of course, the chieftain nearly fell off his horse and said, yes, yes, I've seen a miracle, you can have the land. So again, she got what she wanted. She was had the ability to flow with her strong intention just like the water in a river will find its, it'll meander down and find the way to the sea eventually. And this, that source, that deep spiritual need that she had, that she felt so strongly had to be acknowledged, had to come forth. Um, she found a way to do that. And she didn't, she respected both the chieftain and her parents. And there's so many more stories about her, but Bridget is the matron saint of Ireland. And some would say, indeed, she's the saint of Ireland. And what's wonderful is women like you and me, and no doubt many people um, listening will have tapped in not just to the matron saint and even the Bridget as a goddess, but also now cosmic Bridget is making herself known. There, there's that force of nature um, made manifest, if you will. I love those two stories, Karen. I'm so happy that you told them. And every time I hear you tell those stories, it just feels so alive because she, you know, she was this young girl who just had so much conviction, mm -hmm. uh, that fiery, um, direction you know that she knew exactly what she wanted and she she didn't need to fight anyone to get it she just really followed her path and um and there are you know sacred wells both at Fahart and at Kildare and there's another one in County Clare I believe and probably others but I think those are the three main ones correct me if I'm wrong well actually are there, others? Mm -hmm. there are there are many many, many others yeah uh, but to to actually to finish your question i, I mm -hmm. went a bit off track there <laughs> i want to do when bridget uh, comes in but i i only discovered in fairly recent years in the last 15 20 years that my grandmother kathleen whitty was from kildare and my grandfather her husband granda frank was from clondalkin and both kildare town and clondalkin have Bridget's Wells and a round tower. So if you will, the, the well is the womb and then the phallic tower symbol. And they married. And the house that my grandmother grew up and her mother, Julia Delaney, who was a great woman for the land, she was a midwife. But 
literally there within a stone's throw of Bridget's ancient fire temple. And then she has her two beautiful wells, the garden well and the healing well in Kildare. And then, of course, in Clondalkin, which is a suburb of Dublin, has a beautiful Bridget well, which was saved by the locals. And there are the one in Clare is fabulous. There's a, another amazing Bridget's well in Mullingar near Ishnock, which is the, the navel, if you will, the centre of Ireland. But th there, there are so many even more hidden wells on people's land or you hear, oh, that's Bridget's field, that's Bridget's stream, that's Bridget's. She's all over the island and she extends into Wales. She extends into, she's a connection with Glastonbury Tor, the Bridget's Mound nearby. She goes all the way up to Anglesey, Scotland. Uh, yeah, she spread her cloak far and wide. <laughs> Oh, wow. I love that ancestral story, Karen, about your, your grandmother and grandfather. And so it's so amazing when uh, certain guides, you know, certain goddesses and beings, these spiritual multidimensional beings really call to us. And uh, we were actually talking about that uh, in the last podcast episode with Kathy Jones. She was talking about the the Lady of Avalon really calling people at this time. And I feel similarly what we're talking about with Bridget is she's really calling to people at this time and calling us through the waters, through the sacred fire, through these uh, through these elements. Yeah, it's just really beautiful to, I always love hearing about people's different experiences with these goddess guides because they of course all speak to us differently and I'm sure some of you listening as well have had your own experiences with Bridget or other goddess guides and I would love to talk a little bit about the Bridget's Way pilgrimage that you do every year uh, when you travel from Bridget's Well at Fahart and County Louth to her sacred well at Kildare and maybe you could talk a bit about the journey that uh, this journey and also what inspired you to start the pilgrimage. I am truly honoured to be one of four. Um, we call ourselves co-rediscoverers. Um, I was at the Bridget of Fahert Festival, which was set up by a wonderful group of people, but especially the Celtic scholar Dolores Whelan. And Dolores and I didn't know each other, maybe just to say hello. And we're sitting in the audience of this talk given by the wonderful Anthony Murphy, who I believe you and all your listeners know. And Anthony is an extraordinary man. And he was giving this talk explaining how he and his colleague, Richard Moore, the wonderful artist, how they were looking at what we would call Google star maps. In other words, they were trying to figure out why does St. Patrick light the Paschal fire on the hill of Slane? And what were the Druids in Tara and the High King doing? And he, they were working on this. And they looked up this Google star maps to see what was happening in the skies around this time. And they discovered that the Cygnus, the Swan constellation, was literally flying down the sky. And then at that time, the northern star was Deneb, which was one of the stars in this big swan flying down the sky. And now it's Polaris with progression, but at that time. And they were quite surprised with this. And they literally looked at the map of Ireland and they started to draw a line down, literally as the swan flew. And they noticed that from Fahert, Bridget's Well and Fahert, her birthplace, that in a straight line, there were many sacred sites, including the Hill of Slain, the Hill of Tara, all the way down to the Curra, and where Bridget's monastic city was. And they thought, this is extraordinary. And as Bridget and I, or Dolores and I were sitting in the audience listening to this about Bridget, there you go, I'm calling Dolores Bridget. And frequently she calls me Bridget, it's hilarious. But both of us were mesmerized. Um, instantly and individually we thought I'm going to walk that and afterwards at the talk we got chatting and we shared what we our first strong impulse was and we said oh well we'll walk it together and the word spread 
And before long, we can I do that? I'd love to do that. Oh, I have a great devotion to Bridget. Bridget's Way Celtic pilgrimage, literally, we laugh and we sometimes think that this, this force of nature, universal Bridget energy looked, down, looked down, up or down or wherever she is. And she went, OK, I need some people to rediscover this. You and you. So in other words, what was lovely was Anthony and Richard had the inspiration to find the alignment. And then the two women were the ones that actively put it into place. And we I remember that summer so well. It was 2012. Surprise, surprise. A very interesting time in, in humanity. And we walked. It's nine days. Three threes. We're back to the, the, the threes. We walked it, but not in sequence. So that when the very first inaugural pilgrimage happened was the first time Dolores and I walked it from Fahert all the way down to Kildare. And I'm sure many people know, have heard of the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, the um, St. James's pilgrimage over um, in Spain. Um, and, and a lot of people walk from the Pyrenees over, but you can come up the Portuguese route. There's many routes. And it's become quite, um, yeah, a wonderful pilgrimage for people to do. It can take weeks, up to three weeks, four weeks, depending on where you start. But a lot of people walked it and yearned for something here in Ireland. And they also felt that strong Bridget connection, both men and women. And suddenly here was this nine day pilgrimage where we're walking in the footsteps of our ancestors from her well in Fahert. And we pass through the amazing Sally Cox land and there's a stream there. And there's three really interesting people associated with that stream. One is Bridget, one is Cucullin, and one is King Billy. Now you might think, what could they possibly have in common? It's said that when Bridget walked towards Kildare with, with her, her, her group, her community, to, she stopped at the stream and that it was a holy stream that she uh, cleansed them all in that beautiful tradition we talked about earlier. And then when Cucullin, when previously, when he fought in the battles, the, the Thon Bo Coolin, that amazing legend, that they would bathe themselves in the stream and be healed to go back into battle the next day. And then all the years later, when there was, um, you know, King William of Orange came over and there was the battle again, his soldiers would bathe in the stream. Really interesting. And then you wind down past the Boyne near Newgrange, the Hill of Slain, this magnificent wrath. And there's a, a beautiful crisscross, if you will, of the divine masculine and the divine feminine. So Bridget's way walks down and then there's a masculine walking and the intersection is on a sacred wrath behind this, these magnificent ruins on the Hill of Slain, down to the Hill of Tara. And all along the way, there are smaller, like the Bow Park Mott, there's a uh, rail togue, which means little star, these um, sacred sites, lesser known, all the way down to Kildare. So when we walked it, uh, there was this incredible heat wave for the whole nine days and glorious weather. Anthony and his family came with us. Richard couldn't make it at the time. And uh, I remember Anthony turned to myself and Dolores and he said, so are you going to be doing this for the rest of your lives? And we looked at him in astonishment and we said, oh, we hadn't really thought about that. But of course, we all laughed, um, as you know, Tara, that when Bridget gets you, whoa, she gets you. There, there's that. She embraces you so strongly. And again, there, there's that sense of flow. We unfortunately, we had to postpone the pilgrimage for the last two years because of the COVID pandemic. But next year, the 20, 2022, We'll be back bigger and better than ever. And it was just wonderful to see the amount of people 
on the Bridges Way Facebook page saying, oh, how are you getting on? And when will it be there? And I'm saying a prayer for it. Really special. Yeah. Beautiful story, Karen. And I'm seeing some lovely comments here in the chat as well that really resonated for some of our listeners here. So, so beautiful. And yeah, for anyone who hasn't listened to the episode with me and Anthony Murphy, uh, that's a great episode to listen to in, in, you know, in collaboration with this one, because we talk about the River Boyne and the connection with the goddess Boan, another beautiful sacred feminine connection and the correlation with what's going on in the stars as well, just as you were sharing as well, Karen. So a great episode to listen to as well for those of you who haven't. And, um, we're running a little low on time here, but I do have uh, another question for you, Karen, and then uh, I'd love for you to tell everyone where they can find you and everything. So I, I really, really connect with the idea of women being the tenders of the sacred wells in times long ago and the story of the well maidens, which you mentioned earlier. And I was wondering if you could, uh, to finish our time today, could you talk a little bit about reclaiming the wisdom of the well maidens in our modern times? It's very important, Tara. And um, I'm so glad you mentioned uh, Boan because her story, which no doubt Anthony mentioned, I mean, her husband tended the well of Sagus, or others would say, well, was it Connell as well? And of course, the salmon of wisdom fed on the hazel the hazelnuts that fell from the nine trees surrounding it so this was very much inextricably woven into the the legend and lore of ireland and boan wanted to look into the well and she was told as one of the stories goes no no this is for the men only only and she dared defy the way and she crept in and she looked into the well. Now, one theory is the waters rose up, rose up and they enveloped her and she lost an eye, an arm and a leg and she died. And then another one goes that, um, you know, she was completely washed away. But the one that I prefer is that the water rose up to recognize her beauty and grace, the, the woman the connection between the water and the women, and that she merged with the well water to become the river Boyne. And as above, so below, with the, the Milky Way, Balak and Bofinna in, in the skies. And this goes back to those well maidens. In other words, the wells were tended usually by young maidens. So they would have been say anything from 13 before they married in other words they weren't children and they weren't taking the role of a parent but there was this innocence this young yes the tender age that they could be of service so anybody who came to the well they would offer them sustenance with the water or with food and they would tend the wells and make sure that do you know um leaves weren't falling into it or you get the idea but there came a time when they were no longer respected or honored and there is that awful tale um in in england around the medieval times about how a king came and he defiled one of the well maidens he raped her and they all hid that was it the game is up. They said, no, it's not safe. I can't do this anymore. And it is said from that time, the abundance and the bounty of the land stopped because there had been a sacred link broken. Whereas now we women can begin to make that connection again so that with our men folk, we come into the bountiful abundance. We come into reciprocity with the land, with the alignment, if you will. And particularly the wells, because of that deep source. And that might mean if we, if you have a well near you, if you have a well um, on the land you live, to maybe say there's no litter around it, to, to clear any branches away, any leaves, to, to be of service. And if you're there and other people come and maybe you're doing a little ritual, invite them to join if, 
that um, resonates with them. In other words, we are the modern well maidens and we can give with respect and look after the waters to tend the waters and not just of the wells, but of the rivers, the lakes, the seas, the oceans, and to bring back us into balance and alignment. And because of the connection with women and water, the element, if you think of the selkies of the sea, the seal maidens, if you think of the mermaids, and of course, mermen and selkie seals, the males as well, that there often is that, you're going to smile now, but back in the day in Ireland, when you went to a dance, the men would be on one side of the room, the dance hall and the women on the other. And it was a very brave young man that would walk across the floor and ask somebody up to dance because he had a 50-50 chance she was going to say no. And then he would be, everybody would notice that he was shamed. However, what we all knew really happened was the young man would look across the room and the young girl would smile or she might even wink at him. And then he knew he was in with a 90% chance she was going to say yes if he walked over. So similarly, with the reclaiming of the waters, if we women step up and reclaim and then say to our men folk, yeah, come on, yes, let's do this together. Because we live in extraordinary times when we see our young people and their sexuality is so gloriously fluid. But there are men folk who are a little bit, oh, um, do I open a door for a woman? Do I not? And again, women folk, I want my voice to be heard, but am I too? So there's all this, oh, how are we? And yet, if we listen to, if we look at the land around us, and then we listen to our hearts, again, we can come into that beautiful flowing alignment. Thank you so much, Karen. Really feeling the, the potency of what you just shared and really feeling our sacred role in these times to help bring balance back to the earth. And of course, all of us, no matter what our gender, are here to do that, I think. I, I really believe that's why we're here in these times. That's why we've been born into these times. I agree. Yeah, and to feel that our inherent connection with the water as women can really invite us into that sacred tending once again, and for that to look, you know, different ways and just so, so beautiful to really feel the power of that transmission come through, Karen. And there are some really lovely comments that I, I would love to just read out a few of them. And there was one uh, quick question I think you could probably answer to, uh, but I'll have to find further up. Yeah, so there's one comment here. Love the stories about the connection between women and water, flowing, creativity, healing, spirituality and mysticism, balance and alignment and tending and caring for the wells and the waters of the rivers and the seas. Thank you so much for, thank you both so much for this beautiful podcast. And uh, another person here says, beautiful story, absolutely amazing. Thank you for sharing. Garamagat, deep appreciation. Um, and then there's a question here. My question about the well, if the underground place is the womb, then would the long part be the vaginal space rather than the phallic shape? Yeah, yes. we're, we're both absolutely. nodding. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well done, well said, yes. Yeah, and I'm yeah. so glad you brought that up because um, yeah, if if the the land, the the vaginal, yeah, the vaginal, absolutely. And, and that's why, the entrance is so important and you can imagine why it was so important that it was tended because this is a precious part of our physical bodies and a precious part of the earth. Think of the beautiful cover over the, the um, well in Glastonbury, you know, the chalice well. It's, it's a, a very beautiful ornate metal cover with the grill that that comes down. And some people say, oh, I mean, I don't know if there should be a cover there. But again, it, it, it's a respectful tending of it. Therefore, as you go forward, um, yeah, it, it's all about respect. Mm -hmm. Yes, and something I find really interesting too is to think about the actual, the well, the opening that you see above ground as the, um, 
<laughs> I've lost the word from my mind. The, vulva. Uh, the, the yes, the vulva. Thank you, Karen. I'm glad you knew what I was trying to say, and uh, and how they have Sheila Nagigs carved uh, at some of the sacred wells. To me, that connection really um, is very, very interesting and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, great. So I just see. Uh, Another comment here, I love the romantic examples and I also feel sisterhood woven into this, deeply thankful. Thank you all for your lovely comments. Those of you who are writing comments, so, so beautiful to hear your voice. And I would love to give you this opportunity, Karen, to tell everyone where people can find you and ways that they can work with you and anything else that you'd like to share with everyone. Oh, thank you so much, Tara. Well, I think the, the Moon Manor website is a very good way and uh, Moon Mana M-N-A is the Irish Gaelic that beautiful poetic language it's the word for women in Irish Mana so Moon Mana dot I-E and um, we, we have loads of ways of engaging we, we have a lot of wonderful free things that you can do you can come to I have an ancient Irish wisdom for modern women series that's on once a month half an hour something like this um, there's the, if you want to delve a little bit deeper into the well, there are the moon ritual self ceremonies and that's self paced. So every month there's a theme and you get the little videos and the audio and the written, and then you bring the sacred into your home. And, and again, it's, it's very, uh, reasonably priced. There's the goddess spiral of the year. And very soon I'm going to be doing the autumn equinox, which is so dear to my heart. I love this time of balance in our year. And then once a month I do the lunar gatherings. And it's interesting, Tara, you've just mentioned Sheila in a gig because at the full moon coming up quite soon. In fact, on the eve of the full moon, I am going to offer the Sheila in a gig rites. So these are rites of passage to embrace your sacred sexuality in with your holistic being. And it offers an opportunity if anybody needs some healing within their sexual journey for that as well. So that is fantastic. And if anybody wants to find out about this, it's all on the Moon Manor Instagram page and the Moon Manor Facebook page. And then of course, the, 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 the cherry on the cake, so to speak, is if any of you want to hear the call to be circle facilitators. I teach women to be moon mana circle facilitators. And it's this glorious journey that takes 13 months. Are we surprised at the number? Oh no. Uh, 13 lunar cycles in a year. And that is, yeah, bringing this ancient wisdom to the women in your locality and very much women whose hearts beats with Celtic soul. So that would be moon mana. And then if you're interested, the Irish Celtic shamanic school myself and John run is Shli on Cree. That's S L I A N C H R O I dot I E. And uh, yeah, you might enjoy exploring that. Thank you, Karen. Uh, yes, I've taken Karen's um, circle facilitator training and it's so, so mm. beautiful. And I'm seeing a comment here from Bronwyn as well. The Moon Manal work is amazing for women. Yes, it is. <laughs> Hi, Bronwyn. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also just wanted to mention to everyone as well um, that I am actually doing a beautiful activating sacred feminine waters singing the ancestors session on Friday. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, my singing the ancestors sessions are 60 minutes and it's basically a sacred sound journey. So we'll be going into the theme of activating the sacred feminine waters, very appropriate for <laughs> this conversation today as something that you can do to continue this connection. So yes, please do go and explore all of Karen's beautiful work and go explore uh, this offering that I have on Friday. There's a lot of ways that you can continue to step into this work and reclaim this wisdom. So mm, I'd like to just take this moment to close our eyes and just really feel that connection to the fire that we gathered around at the beginning of this call. Really feel all of the wisdom that's been activated through this conversation, through this transmission. 
and really feeling that connection with our ancestors, with Goddess Bridget, who we've been really calling into this space through this conversation as well. Just feeling supported in this moment by all of the unseen beings and feeling the connection of this global sisterhood as well. Thank you, ancestors. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, thank you, thank you, wise grandmothers. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Thank you, thank you, Tara. Mm. Okay, loves, as much as I could sit here and talk all day <laughs> with Karen, <laughs> it's time for us to go. I'm seeing some more of your beautiful comments in the chat, and I'm going to go and read them all right now. And just thank you so much for all of you who are part of this community. And if you're finding this podcast uh, on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, then please do come and join us in the Dreaming the Ancestors Facebook group. We have such a beautiful community of women from all over the world who are claiming this ancestral wisdom who are walking these ancient pathways of healing and liberation and ancient wisdom so thank you thank you thank you everyone blessed be blessed be mila buikas a thousand thanks mm. thank you <laughs>